today we'll be talking a little bit about minimal, minimally invasive surgery. Um, this is uh, actually a, a, a nice, um, a nice change in sort of the way we've been doing things, and we'll sort of go through the mechanics of what minimally invasive surgery means um, and how we do it, uh, and then we'll answer some questions at the end. Um, so, without further ado, we'll get started. We're going to take a little bit of a military bent to this. We're going to go through some four major things um, to get this started. So, you want to, you, you, you know, there's a checklist of things before you start any 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 sort of um, large-scale exercise and you want to know your objective you want to know the ground you want to know your equipment and then you want to verify that you're mission capable so you know we've got three screens here and for this presentation to work you guys are going to need to be fairly straight on um, and so if you guys are way out on the periphery and you have some problems with the 3d effect then sort of move around I'll be all right all right so the objective for us today is going to discuss minimal access surgery techniques and how they relate to, our, to the injured worker we'll discuss why when and how we do that um, there are going to be some some special slides today and they're going to be marked with some special slide uh, some uh, special markers there that'll tell you when to put your glasses on when to take them off so if, <laughs> so <clears throat> so you can put the glasses on when you see the glasses so Put them on right now, put the red lens on the left eye and the blue on the right, and if it doesn't work for you, reverse it, but you, the, the red lens should be on the left eye. All right, careful, careful. Okay. Does that look good? Okay. This is a pretty severe scoliosis, and I put this slide in here, and one of the reasons this talk is in three dimensions is because the spine is a three-dimensional structure, and, and different deformations of the spine are, are a three-dimensional problem, and so um, a lot of what we do uh, requires being able to think and, and do things in three-dimensional space to help make sure that once we're done operating on somebody, they're in uh, the appropriate spatial relationship so that they don't have problems down the line. Because once you, when we operate on somebody's spine, it's not normal. Um, it's treated for their problem, but we don't make it normal. And what we have to do is make sure that the parts of the spine that we operate on are in a functional position to allow the rest of the spine not to have too much stress so that we delay um, hopefully, uh, another spinal surgery. So why, why do we want to do surgery minimally invasively? So traditional open surgery is done this way. You can keep your glasses on here. And if you get tired of putting them on and putting them off, just leave them on, and some of the slides will give you a headache, but that's okay. <clears throat> so this is what our traditional open surgery looks like. We essentially, um, you know, expose... Oh, where'd my pointer go? You guys see a pointer anywhere over there? Oh, my pointer died. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. But it doesn't show up here. Huh, isn't that interesting? I guess I'll point with the laser pointer. Can you guys see that on the middle screen? So this is the spine here. We, we traditionally expose the spine by stripping all the muscle and, and, and uh, tendon off the spine to expose the parts of the spine that we want to work on. And this is very destructive to the, to the muscles and the tendons that hold the spine together. And you can imagine that if you're operating on the spine and let's say you're doing work here and you have to expose up to here just to be able to see where you are, that that can cause problems at the levels that you're not operating on, which in the future may deteriorate. Plus, doing a big open uh, procedure like this injures the muscle, and that muscle will atrophy over time, which can cause weakness and cause further problems. So in an effort to, to delay that, we try to do things a little bit better. This is sort of a, a picture of the spine here and all the muscles sort of around the spine. Um, this is an MRI scan where you've got uh, the, the bones of the spine here. This is the disc. These are the bones of the spine here. This is the joint that holds the spine together. Here's the spinal sac with the nerves in there floating in there. And then these are the muscles around the spine that for us, let's say we want to take out some disc that's ruptured here. We'd have to come from the skin back here, strip all the muscle off the bone, expose this area, come down in here, do whatever work we need to do, and then come out. And, that, and just the act of stripping all this muscle off with the tools that we use can injure this muscle and over time it can weaken and, and have problems. And so um, in order to prevent some of that, we're trying techniques that aren't so invasive. Um, and these techniques have, are an attempt to reduce blood loss during surgery, to improve the recovery time so that people are up and around faster, um, and reduce failure above and below where we're operating, which is, we, we talk about junctional failure, which is the junction between sort of the normal spine and if you do a fusion, the fused um, or operate on spine. <clears throat> so 
the minimal access techniques can help us reduce what we call approach-related morbidity, which is that, that, that problem of the rest of the body around the spine being injured by us doing the operation that we need to do to help the patient. So when do we do it? <clears throat> so we talk about doing uh, minimal access surgery really in almost any situation you can do it. If they need a decompression, you can use minimal access techniques. If you need a fusion, you can use minimal access techniques. If you have scoliosis, you can now, we have new techniques that we can use in even the correction of, of certain types of scoliosis. Um, reasons not to do it, uh, patients who, ha who have had surgery before is a relative reason not to do it. Not an absolute, but generally a lot of scar tissue, people who've had multiple spinal surgeries before, trying to do things minimal, minimal access can sometimes, unless you're uh, fairly advanced in your technique, can sometimes lead to problems, especially because of the, the scar tissue makes the, the muscle and tissue planes very different from what they would be if somebody's having a first time surgery, um, especially if they've had a traditional open technique. If they've got a large amount of slippage of the spine where the spine doesn't line up correctly, it's hard to correct, or very long segment fusions. You know, our technology is a little bit limited trying to do very long segment fusions for correction of scoliosis with, with minimal access techniques. So how do we do it? So for minimal access surgery, what we try to do is, is provide a keyhole approach to the spine where we only expose the areas of interest. So if we're doing a lumbar fusion, we try to, uh, we try to expose only the joint to try to resect the joint and do, and do the work at the disc while leaving the rest of the spine alone. Um, if we want to do a disc work to try to do a fusion from, uh, from the front, part of the spine without coming, coming through the back. Instead of making a large incision on the belly, we can do smaller incisions on the side and access the disc directly from the side. Um, and we can put in screws through small poke holes in the skin over wires now using, using x-ray in the operating room to help guide the screws in the appropriate position without making the large um, disruptive incisions that we've had in the past. And so our goals are um, if we want to correct uh, um, a deformity, we use bony cuts called osteotomies to help loosen the spine. Um, we maintain the envelope of muscles and tendons around the spine to, to keep it healthy and prevent degeneration. And we, if we're doing a fusion, we do that via uh, grafts in the disc space and really rely on that rather than sort of the old standby where we put in a lot of bone in the, on the back and out on the sides of the spine. We try to really enhance the fusion at the disc space. And so uh, methods for doing that, it's, most of you have your glasses on, you can throw those on. Um, so we'll, we'll start with uh, exposing the spine from the back. Um, so th this is a hollow tube, and hollow tubes are probably the most useful um, um, devices that we have for minimal access surgery. The, the, we use a retractor, essentially minimal access surgery depends on the retractor system that we use to help us expose parts of the spine. And that really, the retractor is just a tube that we put into position um, using x-ray and dilation of the muscle to prevent that injury that we normally do to the muscles when we do standard surgery. <clears throat> The, that, it's not a new thing. I throw this slide in there just to let you know that brain surgery was actually done at the, in, the, in the early 1900s. Brain surgery was done down a tube through a minimal access technique to help prevent injury to the brain. This is a ventriculoscope that one of the pioneers of neurosurgery used to help do surgery within the fluid spaces of the brain to help um, treat disorders there. And so it's not a new thought, but it is uh, a newer technique that we have now with the spine. And so we have various different types of tubes that we can attach to various retractor arms. Uh, these, this is a set of tubes that actually have flanges in them, and you can see the, the, the opening is kind of open. You've got these flanges here that you can then expand so that the entrance to the, to the muscles are, uh, is small, but then when you get down to where you want to work, you pop the tube open, and that gives you a wider um, exposure. That's sort of a view down the tube. Um, this is the tube. Um, opened up and you can see where the entrance, uh, where the entrance is, is smaller, where the entrance is smaller, the part of the part that's actually down the, at the business end is wider um, by these flanges that allow you to expose and then you have a much larger field of view once you have the tube expanded. And the way we put these tubes in is through a, um, a series of dilators. This is, these, are the, these are the actual dilators that we use that we've had a high-resolution CAT scan done and 3D models made of them. And so these dilators go in sequentially through the muscle to help dilate the muscle. And over these dilators, the tube goes in, that gets fixed into place, and then the dilators come out. <clears throat> and so the way we do that 
is let's say we're trying to affect a spinal fusion. Well, to do that, we come in um, at the side of this of the spine at the level of the um, at the level of the joint there. And so this is this is um, some a cross section of a person here. Their belly is here. We're operating back here on the skin. And this is the joint where if you're doing a spinal fusion for somebody, the nerves run in here, okay? These are the joints back here. If you're going to put a screw in, it's going to go in right here, okay? If you're going to do some disc work, you have to come by right by the, right by the nerve here, and to do that, you have to remove some bone back here. And for a fusion, the easiest way to do that is just remove the joint here on one side. That gives you access to the disc. You can decompress the, the, the spinal nerves there, and you can put your screws in all at the same time. And so... We dilate through the muscles in the spine here. And instead of stripping them, making a big incision in the middle and stripping all the muscle off the spine all the way out here, what we do is make a smaller incision off to the side and use these dilators to come down, capture the joint here, and just dilate through the muscle without injuring it. Once that's done, you can put your retractors in, depending on what you want. That's uh, just a fun effect for the open retractor. And then there's the retractor going in, and then the dilators come out. <clears throat> and now you've got a short tube at the surface. They come in different lengths. You've got a short tube at the surface of the skin that allows you, that allows you to have a working channel to work down and do what you need to do. And so what that looks like is this. is Coming down the tube, you've got this exposure to the joint here with the rest of the spine hidden very nicely behind all the intact muscle. Okay. And so you've got this. You, this is where you're going to be working. And so another view, this is sort of what we see when we've got the tube in place, um, is the joint structure here. The nerves live over here. This is the spinal canal over here. Um, these, are the, um, these are the spines that come off the side of the spine that are called the transverse processes. And if you're going to put a screw in, it's going to go here. The disc space is here. And you see, to be able to get in there, we've got to get some bone out of the way. And so <clears throat> this is just another picture of the whole spine exposed. This is back to our thing. And so we can start biting off some of this joint. Complete, completing that gives us access to the disc space here beyond the joint. And what's not pictured here are the nerves, which run right in this space here. Um, and down low in the spine, they start to come right out here. And so what you can do is once you remove all this joint material, you can, let me get rid of it, you can now get in here, move the nerve over, which is running in this space like this to come out the hole at the bottom of the spine here, and do your work in the disc. And you're coming in, uh, with this approach, you come in way off to the side. And so you're not coming in um, more towards the middle. So you have to retract the nerve less, which causes less problems with stretching of the nerve and potentially less problems with potential injury to the nerve when you're doing surgery. And so you can move the tube down to look at different structures lower. You can move it up to look at structures higher up. These are where you would put in the screws that go into the spine um, that you guys have been hearing about all day. In addition to fusion type procedures, you can do simple decompression type procedures with minimally invasive techniques. And the most common sort of decompression that we do is a laminectomy. And this is a patient that I operated on a couple of weeks ago. And you can see they've got, um, this is a cross section of the spine here. And I, I, you guys, did you guys see MRI scans earlier? Did somebody sort of walk you through any of these things? Um, this, is a, this is a spine sort of sliced up like a stalk of celery. And you can see here, the, here's the canal where the nerves run. And, at every level except for this green line here, it's fairly narrow to begin with, but here you can see there's this bulging of ligament right here, which is narrowing where the nerves run. And you can see normally, you, you see this, this um, area where the nerves run has become very triangulated when normally it's very round and open with the nerves floating and you can't even see the nerves floating in it. The joints are a little bit bad here and this person has a lot of leg pain from compression of their nerves here. Not so much back pain. The traditional exposure to get this decompressed would be to go in right in the middle, take all this bone out, disrupting all the ligaments and muscles on the other side. His joints are already bad here, and so the issue with doing that surgery is that disrupting all this tissue back here and weakening that with bad joints here, even if you get the nerves decompressed, he may be back in three to six months and need a fusion because now you've disrupted all the muscles around his spine. To, to boot, this guy is about 325 pounds, and so he's got a lot of stress on this area. And so the, 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 way, to, the way to treat this without disrupting the spine as much is to try to do this minimally invasively, and we can do that. And we do that this way. 
Same, same picture, but now instead of coming down on the joint, we come down on this part of the bone here called the lamina, which allows us access to, to do the decompression that we need to do by coming in and removing some of this bone. We take out the ligament while leaving the joint alone, and then we can sneak underneath because of our angle from, from the side here, because of our angle we can come down and cut off some of the bone here and remove this ligament here, effectively decompressing the nerves and leaving the joints alone. And more importantly, you leave all this muscle and tendon all alone. So you're not disrupting any of the part of the spine on the other side to, tr to allow that to remain as strong and intact as possible to hopefully delay any further need for any other surgery. And again, we put the, put the retractor in, take the dilators out, and we've got, the, um, we've got our working channel. This is sort of a, the, the view of the spine that you need to do to do a laminectomy. These are, the, these are the lamina here. This is where the nerves run, that space there, okay? This is the joint. And so our focus is gonna be in this area here. And so down the tube, that looks like this. Now the tube has a specific size, and there's only so much distance between these, the bones at the middle of the spine and the joint. Which you try, you put the tube down, and it gives you a little bit of this exposed, but you avoid injury here and do all your work there. And so, what that looks like is you remove some bone, and that gives you access to the nerves inside the spinal canal, gives you access even to the disc space while leaving the leaving the um, the joint alone. You can remove some of this joint without too much instability, but the nice thing about doing it this way is even taking some of this joint here, which you have to do to do an appropriate decompression, you're leaving the other one almost completely alone. And so that this, this technique allows you to really reduce how much injury you're doing to the spine. The other thing is you can move the tube down to get a little bit of exposure down. If, if, you've got, if you want to get the, get the disc, you can move it up if you want to get the, get the nerves decompressed above and below where you're working. So you're not locked into a particular position. Once that tube's in there, you can actually move it around and get a better look. And the other thing you can do is you can rotate the tube, move it around closer to the middle to give you all that sort of look that you want to see. You can rotate the tube to get you a little bit of better look once the, we'll see once this video starts going here. Well. That didn't work as well as I wanted it to. I'll try that again. All right, we'll skip that. So this is sort of the intraoperative view down the tube. So you can if you take your glasses off, you get a better look. So now what you're looking down is you're looking down the tube, and, and this is the spinal sac where the nerves run, which you don't see here. You know, this is all bones up here. But here's our spinal sac here. You can see the ligament here compressing the spinal sac, and especially, this is the left side. We're coming in from the left. That's the right side. So I'm looking all the way across to the other side of the spine here, all from the left side. And you can see the ligament that's really compressing the nerves in this area. And so after we take that ligament out, which we can do with our instruments, we've got a nice open spinal canal. We're looking at the top of the spinal tube, of, the, of that tube that holds the, the nerves. We've removed all the bone, we've taken away the ligament, and now, you're, now you've got a little video where you can actually see the nerves bouncing around with the heartbeat in the spinal sac, because now, now the nerves have been decompressed. And all this work has been done through a, a tube that's um, 22 millimeters in diameter, okay, and is about six centimeters long, so you're working down that tube. And the incision for this procedure is three centimeters long. And so, the, and I can, do one, I can do one level through a three centimeter incision. I can do two levels through a three centimeter incision. I can do three levels through a three centimeter incision. And all that, all that I have to do to do the level above or below, pull the tube out, put the dilators down through the same incision that I've already made, through the muscle to the level above or below. And that allows me to access a large amount of the spine through one small incision in the skin and through atraumatic dilation of the muscle. The other thing you can do is you can take out a disc And this is what a disc looks like. This is a, uh, another patient of mine that I operated on recently. Large disc herniation here. You can see it right here. It's mashing on her nerves here and really causing quite a bit of, of leg pain. She's got no back pain, no reason to do a fusion. She's got a huge, a huge disc herniation here. And so how do we get at that? Now, 
minimal access techniques for for this procedure really don't do a whole aren't a whole lot different than open techniques for this particular procedure just because the standard procedure is is a small incision with minimal trauma to the to the muscle as well the one thing that's nice about doing this minimally invasively is again you're not burning the muscle off the bone you're just sort of dilating through it atraumatically and so that reduces how much scar tissue is in the muscle if the patient needs another surgery in the future <clears throat> So again, we're looking down the tube at, at a similar decompression that we had before. We're going to go quickly to, a, um, um, to an operative picture here. And so you, you can leave your glasses off. So this is, this is the view down the tube now. We've done our laminectomy. So the, the tube's actually, the, the picture where the tube is is turned in comparison to this up here. The, the long axis of the spine is going this way up here. It's going this way, if you can imagine. This is muscle sitting on top of that joint that we talked about earlier to try to pr protect it. This is the bone that's actually been removed here. And then here is the coverings of the spinal sac. And then this is ligament here that we have to then remove. And we do that. Um, with this instrument that has a little biting head, and we start to remove the ligament here to get us exposure to the spinal sac. Once all the ligament's gone, we now have the, the nerve is actually running in the spinal sac here and exiting below us here. The disc is on the other side of this nerve here. Okay, And so to get there, we have to move that nerve aside. It looks like this. So we've got, a, we've got a suction tube over here. We've got a retractor over here pulling the spinal sac and nerve over. And then this is the disc material here. And just a short video of, of what that looks like, because it's a little bit harder to get those relationships looking at it in still motion. So this is a video of the operation where we've, we've, got, the, we've got a little retractor here, but that the, um, the disc is such a huge mound that it's hard to even get any of this retracted over enough to get to the disc. So I've gone ahead and opened up the space there where the disc is. That's a little bit of the disc sort of pooching out there, and we'll pull out a little fragment of the disc. This disc was very large and came out in multiple little fragments. But you can see the, the nerve is running here. We're pushing it over so that we can get the disc out, which is right here, and it'll be coming out shortly here, at least part of it. So there's the big disc fragment there. The nerve here is very minimally retracted. And you know, you don't have to. You've got, you've got plenty of visualization down this tube to do all the work that you need to without having to disrupt the, all the muscles of the spine. And then when you pull the tube out, so this is the tube about halfway out. This is the muscle around where we've been working now. It's been dilated through. It, this is about two centimeters lower than this. So it's a little bit hard to get depth. But this is where we were working. Now all this muscle, as we pull the tube out, it closes in and is nice and healthy and isn't burned or disrupted from our operation. As you take the tube out, all that muscle closes in and gives you a very nice um, vascular tissue that covers your wound, reduces your risk of infection, and, and uh, is a much healthier place to be rather than a big open operation. Other things we can do if we want to come in from the side to get the disc, you can get your glasses back on. <clears throat> So this is somebody's abdomen. This is what used to be, uh, this is a, oh, sorry, skip this one. This is a the picture of the spine with the blood vessels sort of around the spine. You want to stay away from the blood vessels doing any approach from the side. But this is what we used to do to try to get to the spine from the side. Big fillet open of the spine. This hurts. I don't have to tell you that, that this hurts. All your, all, your, all your abdominal muscles here that allow you to bend your spine side to side, you know, breathe and compress your, you know, hold your organs in, all those abdominal muscles you have to cut through just to get to the disc space, which is right here. You can see your target, your target space is here, but our incision spans essentially the entire side of the body. And so that, for a long time, a long time ago, we used to do this to get there. And then we started doing everything from the back because this was just too much for people to handle. But now we've got some nice minimal access techniques that so we can get to the disc space, um, which allows you to uh, get there with much less injury to the abdominal musculature. This is a picture of a fellow laying on his side. You can see all the, all the abdominal contents sort of fall forward, so your, your bowels are out of the way, and your incision is going to be here rather than from here to here. So even on somebody of this size, you don't have to, you, you don't have to make a humongous incision. Okay? So this is what you look like sort of sliced in half, laying on your side. Here are the pelvis, here are actually the hip bones here, 
Um, here's your spine here, kidney here, no kidneys were injured during the production of this presentation, even though it looks like it's been cut in half, it hasn't. This is the muscle that runs on the side of the spine that helps you lift your leg up, sort of lift your knee up. And this is the disc. And so to get there, we make an incision on the side, and we come down with dilators through the muscle in front of the kidney, through the muscles um, to dilate down to where the disc space is. And that looks something like this. Okay. And then again, the, the down the tube look gives you this sort of exposure. And now you've just exposed where you're going to operate. You've not exposed the abdomen. You've not exposed air. You just exposed the disc space where you're going to work. And so the next couple of slides are not 3D. So this is a 3D model of the spine, the disc. This is our target area here. This is what it looks like under fluoroscopy. And this has actually been operated on. There's a, there's a spacer in that disc space. And so there are a lot of nice things about doing this. But the nicest thing about doing this from the side is if you, look at, if you look at somebody who has a scoliosis, let's say they've had a previous disc removal, they've got some degenerative disease where when you look at them from the front, instead of their spine lining up, they've got disc collapse on one side with a lot of degenerative disease and their spine is angulated. Well, that's not how your spine's designed to be. Your spine's designed to be straight up and down. That's, that's what gives us our lowest energy state to allow us to walk without feeling tired, having muscle spasms, having back pain. When your back looks like this, that, that causes problems because now you're putting force on, on different sides of your spine differently, and that causes problems with premature wear in your facet joints and so on. You can use some nice mineral access techniques to come in from the side, break up those, those, the, those degenerative processes, use a big graft that then comes in across the disc space and makes things parallel again and can really straighten up a deformity very, very powerfully through a very small incision, through a very minimally invasive and destructive type of process to get people um, where they need to be. <clears throat> so correction of, of deformity we do through anterior inner body grafts and releases, just like I showed you. We make bony cuts in the back through the tubes to try to get things loosed up. We position people in, on special tables to, get, to allow gravity to help us do some work. We do some manipulation with some of the devices that we have during surgery, and uh, we can get deformity corrected actually fairly nicely. And um, are, some of these pictures are actually some, some pictures from my fellowship. Well, this is kind of what it looks like when you're doing minimal access surgery. The incision looks long, but the incision is just in the skin. All the muscle is still attached to the spine. This is just in the skin and fat. And now you've got the muscles been dilated through and wires have been put into the bones. And over these wires, you put screws down and you have extenders sticking out through the, through the muscle look like this. And you can use those to help manipulate the spine to get things decompressed. You can put, the, you can put a rod in through a small poke hole in the skin that slides down through the extenders. And then you lock it in there. And when you do that, you can take somebody, um, somebody and get them better. So let's look at some cases now. And I'll talk a little bit about another patient that I operated on. This is a, this is a gentleman who came to me um, with a disc herniation here above a previous discectomy here, okay? And if you look at his MRI scan, you can see that his disc looks pretty bad there. This big disc fragment is sticking down here and it's causing him a ton of leg pain. You look at his x-ray and at the level of his, um, at the level of his previous discectomy, he's starting to collapse down on one side, okay? And his spine is starting to curve over towards the right here, okay? If you look at his CAT scan, you can see there's air in the disc space at his previous discectomy, which is a sign of advanced wear and tear. And his, the bony collapse where those bones are, have been rubbing on each other for so long has caused a reactive bone growth. And so all this dense white stuff is reactive bone growth. The normal vertebral body on a cat skin looks like this. The outer cortex is solid bone. The inner stuff is sort of a more spongy bone that is where your, bone, where your blood is made in the bone marrow. But here, that bone marrow is really turned to solid bone because it's resisting the force, the abnormal force that that spine is having to see because of its abnormal orientation in space. And I'll put a little, um, I'll put a little plug in for why when I see somebody that I'm going to do the spinal fusion on, I always get a CAT scan because the CAT scan shows very different information from an MRI scan, which also shows very different information from what we see on plain X-ray. And in fact, a plain standing x-ray gives us a lot of information about what the spine is doing in space that an MRI scan with somebody laying on their back doesn't give you. And so that's why when we evaluate somebody, especially when we're doing a, a spinal reconstruction, we get all these studies and why they're all important. Another reason I particularly like to get CAT scans is you can do pre-surgical pre planning to make sure that um, you're putting in 
a, a screw, you know your trajectories, you know where your joints are, you can actually measure out the screw distances and widths. And for major spinal correction, I do this with every, for every screw that goes into every person so that we can make sure that we're, we're putting in appropriate size screws and not having problems that look like this, not a screw I put in, by the way. Um, where the screws go in places you don't want to. Now, that doesn't eliminate errors like this. Errors like this can happen, but certainly having a nice dry run with the imaging in a three-dimensional space, allowing you to pre-plan a surgery allows you to reduce some errors that may otherwise happen. And so you can get screws that look like this and maybe a little bit hard to project, but the screw is right down the pipe here. It's an appropriate length. It's an appropriate width because it completely fills the pedicle and improves its pull-out strength. So that's just a little plug there. So this is this fellow we operated on. I, I took his disc out through a tube, and I did a two-level fusion, both at his level where his disc herniation was, and then at the level below to correct his, his deformity there and straighten him up quite nicely, all minimally invasively. The screws are put in over wires in the back through uh, three small incisions. The, um, the, he's got one incision on his side that allowed me to treat two discs. Um, and he's doing quite well. He said he hasn't, his back pain, and this is probably somebody who's a bit more motivated than average people, but this fellow's been having back pain for 20 years since his first discectomy. And he said he hadn't been, he hadn't had back pain relief like, like after this surgery for 20 years. And so that makes me feel really good. And he was essentially off his pain medicines in two weeks. And that, that also goes along with minimal disruption of the spinal muscles around with, with these techniques. And again, like Dr. Tibbs said, a lot, of these, a lot of these techniques that we talk about are techniques that are very patient specific. You really have to select your patient appropriately and, and, um, and, and apply the technique that is appropriate for the patient. And for this guy, this surgery was, was the right thing for him. And if you look at him from the side, this is his before x-ray where he's fairly straight in through here. We gave him a little bit more curve to his low back, which he needed to, to be in an appropriate position. We got his grafts in up here where hopefully he'll, he'll fuse across here. We got him nicely decompressed and he's happy and that's good. Um, other, if you wanna be a little bit more um, aggressive, you can do something like this, minimally invasively, where you have somebody who has a degenerative scoliosis of their lumbar spine, where they're got, you know, this, this should be straight right here, but you've got a lot of collapse, the bones are falling off, um, you've got compression of the nerves as they leave the spine, causing leg pain and back pain, and you can convert this into something like this, where you're nice and straight and balanced um, with uh, minimal access techniques. Uh, with reduced time for recovery. Um, and actually in this person, with this problem, we actually saved this person, um, we saved this person probably four levels of fusion. This is somebody that we would have probably had to treat um, at least from here to here to correct her problem, down into her pelvis. And using minimal access techniques because we're reducing the trauma to the muscles that connect the spine to the pelvis, we were able to stop short of the pelvis because the disc space looked okay. And we were able to stop short of her thoracic spine. So we saved this lady who's an active tennis player, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, fusion levels just by applying a more minimal approach to, to correcting her deformity. If you want to go crazy, you can do something that looks like this and turn it into something that looks like this, all using minimal access techniques. And so those are all, um, those are all, this is sort of the cutting edge of where we are with minimal access surgery. And uh, you know, we're not done yet, but um, there are a lot of things that we can do that are fairly exciting and, um, and treat patients well and get them back, um, hopefully working faster. All right, that's it. Thanks very much.